Um, next, we'll be hearing from Hugh Williams with Pivotal, who will be interviewed by Michael Chewy from McCube, McKinsey Global Institute. Pivotal, if you don't know, is this very interesting company that was set up, what, about a year and a half ago now? Yeah. About a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And the thesis is that basically every industry will be managing large amounts of data and be building software applications off of that to both gather information about their products and processes and to generate in something like live situations um, new iterations of their products and processes. He's been in the business for over 20 years, seen a lot of changes, had a lot of experience with the industry and with the theory. So I think we'll both, we'll all learn a great deal here. Thank you. You two guys, please thanks. join us. Thanks. Thanks, Quentin. Uh, and thanks to the iSchool for inviting us to have this conversation. We were looking forward to a couple of ferns, but uh, unfortunately they were <laughs> unable to provide those. <laughs> Uh, but thank you, Hugh, for uh, joining us up here. Um, who's having fun with data? Anyone? Yeah, good time. Who's, who's actually in the iSchool data science program here? Uh, that's fun. All right, great. Um, so many of us who are having fun with data, for us, it's a relatively recent thing, right? And we, you know, we talk about, you know, you know Stephen had you know, Hadoop up, and you know, we had a lot of terrific speakers. Um, who've been doing tremendous things with data, but only for the past few years, right? And so, Hugh, uh, who've, who uh, has joined us, you know, has been doing this for a couple of decades. So, um, you know, and we often talk about the fact, uh, again, Steve made that comment just briefly, that uh, just recently, that, uh, you know, a lot of the, the big data stuff and the analytic stuff is about, you know, about, about people, you know, hashtag telling stories, right? Hashtags, never mind. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so I, I'm going to ask Hugh to tell some stories based on a career which has spanned data for quite some time, right? So Hugh, why don't we start? Where, where are you from, and uh, where did you go to school, and what did you study? Yeah, so I, I think you'll figure it out pretty quick, but I'm from Australia. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I grew, up, uh, I grew up near Melbourne, uh, which is in the southeast corner of Australia. Um, I grew up in a little country town. Uh, I f first got involved in computing when I was eight years old. Uh, my, my dad had a job at uh, ESO, which is a subsidiary of Exxon, and uh, it's a long story. He kind of bluffed his way into being a computer programmer at the time. Uh, there were some Fortran books kind of lying around the house. <laughs> so I figured out how to program in Fortran. He used to uh, uh, have uh, ta paper tape at home, give it to dad, dad would take it to work, bring back core dumps, figure out what happened. <laughs> you know, rinse what, and repeat. What are you saying? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a bad coder for a long time, yeah. Um, and uh, then I, I, uh, I went to uh, university, as we call it in Australia, you know, college as you call it here, um, in, in Melbourne. Uh, I went to a place called RMIT University, so we put the R in MIT. It's like uh, RMIT. <laughs> that's it. Um, uh, went there. I went there in two stints, actually, um, and it's quite common in Australia to do your graduate studies where you where you do your undergraduate studies. So it's not as unusual as perhaps it is here. Um, so I, I went there and did some undergraduate studies. Uh, had a had a career in industry about five years, and then went back and did a PhD in computer science. So what was your computer science uh, PhD in? Yeah, so it was very interesting, actually. So again, long story, but I um I met a I, I met this really interesting guy who was. Um, somewhat well known in the field of text retrieval. So, you know, back then it was, it was prim primarily a kind of library science thing. So this, this is sort of before the advent of, of search engines really on the web. This uh, used to be a library science school, actually. Yeah, and, and we owe them a lot. Um, and uh, I met this interesting fellow. So he's a sort of a text retrieval guy. He's primarily sort of an algorithms guy. And he, and he says to me, um, and I can tell you why I had an interest in sort of biology and chemistry at the time, but um, he says to me, look, I." There's this, there's this really interesting project going on right now, the Human Genome Project. It's failing you. And what's happening is um, databases of, of DNA and protein sequences are doubling in size sort of sub-yearly. Um, and the techniques that are used to, to search these databases are, uh, sort of bear a lot of, rep, a lot of similarity to the sort of basic spelling correction algorithms, kind of, so, you know, sort of advanced versions of grep if you've, if you've ever used kind of Unix utilities. Um, and he says, well, this isn't going to scale, right? So, so you, you can't be linearly processing a whole database every time somebody wants to pose a query. You can't, you can't compare every single sequence in the database to the query. Like, that's simply just not going to work. I mean, you, you, know, you can imagine how fanciful that would be in, you know, in relational databases or, or something, or text retrieval itself. He said, so this is a very interesting problem. Um, would, you like to, would you like to work on it? Um, and I thought this was wonderfully applied. You know, I thought this is... 
this is a really interesting sort of algorithms problem in a in a in a space that's very important. You know, where I where I hopefully could have some some interesting some interesting impact. Um, and so I kind of fell into that. Um, you know, it wasn't called computational biology then. It wasn't certainly wasn't called bioinformatics. It was just you know text retrieval guys working on uh, DNA and protein sequences, but obviously later became, a, later, later became sort of a valid field of computer science. But um, that was really my first encounter with sort of big data, if you like, was, you know, uh, getting shipped these uh, uh, CDs full of, uh, full of sequence data. So how big was the data then? Um, oh, look, trivially small in today's <laughs> terms, but, but, you know, I'd get the, uh, uh, and they didn't compress the data either, and I used to think that was very frustrating. But they, they'd send me, you know, when I, when I first started working on the problem, I used to get like the four CD set from the, um, uh, from, from um, I'm trying to think who it was. It, it must have been like the NCBI or somebody like that, some, some part of the National Institutes of Health. And I'd get the four CD set. And by the time I got close to finishing my PhD, so three years later, you know, it was like that the 12 CD set <laughs> or something that they'd be sending me. And then very soon after that, they had this, had this great idea, we'll, we'll put it online and you can FTP it. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, but you know, you could you could you could materially feel that the collections were doubling in size every nine months or so because the, the you know the, the mail that you got in the post was uh, was doubling in size, in, in weight. Um, so then you actually stayed on and, and became faculty, right? Yeah, yeah, which was the strangest thing ever. So you know, I was kind of an entrepreneurial sort of guy. So you know, when I when I when I finished college the first time, I, I kind of just started my own company with some friends. And again, this is pre the web. Um, it wasn't called a startup back then. It was called a company. Um, and, uh, Did it require profits and things like uh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely required profits because you know I just finished college and owed a lot of money to the government and all those kinds of things. So, um, so you know, we just kind of rolled up our sleeves and built software, and uh, lots of fun things happened there. Not not terribly many sort of. Um, sort of big data type things, but um, I did that. But, you know, so I, I sort of fell back into doing this PhD because it sounded entrepreneurial and important and interesting, and it sort of, uh, it, it was a nice fit with, uh, with the sort of commercial work that I was doing on the side. Um, and so I had this intention, you know, as soon as I finish my PhD, I'm sort of going to be more qualified, better able to sort of get a job in industry, you know, I'm going to, it's going to be make me a more successful entrepreneur. And of course, that was very, very naive, right? Because, you know, what a PhD qualifies you to do is, is, is do research and, you know, a very common place to do that is in a university. And, and so I kind of figured out I was qualified for something that I didn't expect to be qualified for. Um, so I, yeah, so I was offered a job, a sort of tenured, tenured job kind of out of the gate, actually. And um, uh, you know, I just kind of, kind of took it because I was, I was really fascinated by the process of research. I really enjoyed teaching. Um, I really kind of enjoyed the problems I was working on. And I could do a little bit of consulting on the side, which I, which I was enjoying as well. So yeah, I just I sort of accidentally became an academic. So what were you doing research on? More uh, bioinformatics? Or? Yeah, so I started off there. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people kind of continue their PhD for, for a couple of years after they've got it. Um, you know, sort of wrap up things and do some interesting things. But, but you know, this was, this was the time when the web was becoming a big deal. So this is kind of, uh, we're getting into the late 90s now. Um, and, you know, search engines were, were starting to be a really big deal. Um, you know, there were a lot of very, very interesting challenges around sort of the data structures and algorithms that sort of underlie search uh, <laughs> engines. Um, uh, you know, there's some interesting data becoming available. So some query logs were published by a couple of the major search engines. So if you remember Excite um, and Ask Jeeves, you know, they put, they put uh, query logs in the, in the public domain. So all of a sudden there was data. Um, uh, there was a, a thing going on in the US called Trek that was producing sort of large data sets, of web data sets that you could get. So suddenly there was all this data and this very interesting sort of uh, web search domain emerging. So I, I kind of got into that. I mean, at the core, I was a text retrieval guy who'd been interested in DNA and protein sequences. And um, you know, now I was a text, text guy who got very, very interested in web search and all sorts of facets of web search. Um, so that's sort of where I kind of centered myself for um, uh, five, six, seven years after after I kind of um, did a little less computational biology. So I Alta vista would you, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> may they rest in peace. Yeah. I discovered actually that you have worked for some of the biggest names in in uh, computing history, right? Yeah. So eventually you left the academia and you ended up Microsoft. So what, what, what did you do there? And, and how did you make that decision? You went from the ivory tower to uh... Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll just tell you a secret story, right? And just, right. Just, just between just, us. OK. Just, <laughs> so I got a Google offer in 98, which I probably should have taken, frankly. But, um, <laughs> but I, I didn't. I was just having a, really, a real blast being a professor. You know, I really, really was enjoying that. And, and so in hindsight, that was a great decision, actually. But, um, but I didn't take it. But you know, th there, was a, there was sort of a period there where Yahoo and Google were trying to gobble up every 
sort of every researcher who was who was working in, in sort of a in the public domain and try and sort of you know get them into the company to sort of further what they were doing. So you know Google was was gobbling people up in the late 90s. Yahoo was doing the same. I kind of resisted Google. I resisted Yahoo, and then um, you know in 2003 somewhere around there. Um, uh, a friend of mine at, at Microsoft, so a wonderful researcher at Microsoft, kind of called me up and he said, "Look, we're we're, we're doing this startup in the company, um, you know, literally doing a startup in the company. It'll, it's the best backed thing you'll ever see. We've got our own building, and we're going to go and we're going to go head to head with Google. Um, you know, you should come join. You know, like you can be one of the founding members of this thing. And at that point, I think I'd, i um, you know." Well, I was sort of still kind of enjoying being an academic. I felt like you know I'd achieved most of the things I wanted to achieve. You know, there's something about oh, you probably found this in your career, but you know, you, there's something about you know you this sort of get this enormous energy from climbing a mountain. You know, sort of I'm getting I'm getting up the top. And you get up the top and you go, oh now what? <laughs> uh, now what do I do? And I felt like that had happened in my career. So I was I was very open minded about doing something different. This um, can I pause though? Yeah, what, yeah, why did you resist Google and Yahoo? What was the thinking? Um, because I'm sure people in the room will have opportunities and they'll have to figure out why, why should I think? Yeah, um, I, I think one, one pattern, you know, when I look back, when I, when I look back through, you know, through my career is I tend to make a lot of my decisions based on sort of the, the people I might find myself working with or that I am working with. And I think at that particular time in my career I was working with some, some, some wonderful leaders um, at RMIT University. You know, I was working with uh, this guy Justin Zobel who I'm sure many of you don't know, but you know he was a, 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 a brilliant mind who um, who was a was a wonderful, who still is a wonderfully gifted writer, um, and you know I just I just really enjoyed sort of working with him directly and, and um, uh, you know working on the problems I was working on, and I, and I really enjoyed writing, and you know and he was a wonderful coach uh, in in helping me learn how to write, and I was just I was really enjoying that. You know my personal circumstances were perfect at the time, and I was very very happy. And so I was kind of just very centered on what I was doing. Um, and um, with all due respect to, 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 to Google, you know, I just didn't, you know, when, when I spoke to those guys, it, you know, the, the lights didn't go off in the way, you know, I, I, I perhaps hoped they would. Um, so, I was, so I really just, you know, walked past it. And as I say, I have no regrets. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I had some wonderful opportunities that came, that came later. Um, I think the Microsoft one was different. You know, I, I had this wonderful friend. I went, I went and met, uh, I went and met the team in Seattle, and I thought, wow, this is this is it. You know, this is this is a special bunch of folks with a, with a really big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, you know, these are a really tight set of people who I can learn a ton from. Which was what? What was the goal? What was the story? Um, so I, 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 I think you know. I don't know if they explicitly would have said it, but you know what I, what I took away is you know we want to be the best search engine in the world. You know we want to we want to we want to build a better search engine than Google. You know, let's us as a small group, and you know you could have you could have fit the group um, you know in that section of the of the room like it was a really small set of people. Um, you know, let's let's just be the best that there ever is, and um, and you know, and just go build the best search engine that there could possibly be. And it was, it was very non-commercial at the time either. You know, it was it was let's just build the best product for customers, and and there was a very deep belief within that team that 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 was what they could do. Um, and I thought that was very special. So I, I uh, grabbed my family, dragged them out of Australia, up to Seattle, and off we went. And how'd it go? Ah, oh, went pretty good. <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun. Um, you know, I. Um, maybe to, to tell you a, tell you a story about it. So, you know, I'm at some level, you know, a bit younger than I am now, and somewhat naive and things. And I uh, I, I turn up at Microsoft. Um, it's a little crowded our our building, so uh, Microsoft loves to give every person their own office. Um, but I find that we've sort of run out of offices, and offices are allocated strictly on time served in the company. So if you've been there 20 years, you get a beautiful window office. If you've been there five minutes, not so good news. So, um, so I get a, an interior office with another guy who's been there five minutes. Um, and I, I sit down with this guy, um, and he's, uh, he's, a, he's a guy who's a little bit older than me. He's got sort of white, bushy beard. Um, I found out later he hates being referred to as Santa, but you get the idea. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're sort of sitting there, and um, he's working on his thing, and I sort of ask him about it over a period of a couple of weeks. So what is it you exactly do? And he tells me a couple of things. And he says, what is it you exactly do? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'm sort of waiting to be assigned to my tasks or something. Um, but you know, I think, I think what the management team was waiting for me to sort of get my feet and think about what it is that I wanted to contribute. And uh, so I'm a little at sea. He's working on his thing. And then one day he turns around to me and he says, we should build an image search engine. <laughs> and I said, that'd be pretty cool. 
And he said, yeah, I know how to do that. I built AltaVista's first image search engine. <laughs> and I went, oh, you're that Nick White. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And uh, I thought, that'd be fun. <laughs> um, so we both sort of nervously went and saw our boss and said, you know, maybe something we could think about doing here where we could you know, maybe take, take, uh, take a lead and uh, show some thought leadership would be to build an image search engine. And he said, great, let's do it. Um, so Nick and I kind of went back to our office and went, oh dear, <laughs> okay. Um, and so we, we started the image search, um, we started the image search uh, uh, project at, uh, at Microsoft and um, that, was a, that was a hugely fun ride. I had, a, I had a complete blast for a couple of years. There's a couple of good data stories in that. Um, but, uh, Please tell one. Yeah, okay. Um, let me tell you about infinite scroll. So, you know, you, you guys have all, I'm sure, used web properties where, you know, you just keep on scrolling, like there's no pagination. Um, so I'm lucky enough to have invented that. Um, and that, uh, that happened. Um, <laughs> um, and I'll tell you how that happened. Um, because Microsoft's image search was the first thing to have infinite scroll. Um, so I'm sitting in a room. I've got some pizza, as you always do when you're an engineer. Um, I'm sitting with this guy, um, this guy Nick Craswell. He's a, not, not Nick, Nick White, another Nick. This wonderful woman, uh, Julie Farago. Um, and we're basically using sort of big data style infrastructure, um, looking through how people behave uh, when they use image search on the web. And so it turns out, um, just you know, keeping vast amounts of data in this sort of data lake infrastructure. It turns out if you if you, if you look through this data, you, you find out that um, in contrast to web search, people paginate a lot in image search. So 75% of people roughly in web search don't go beyond page one. Um, to hit that kind of 75% threshold in image search, you have to go to about page seven. So people paginate a lot. So you go, paginate, paginate, paginate. I remember, um, and I've told this story before, but I remember looking through these logs and finding out, finding a customer who went to page 77 before she clicked on a picture of a butterfly. And that wasn't uncommon. Like, you, you, could, you, could, you could find patterns like that pretty easily. So, so, yeah, if you imagine you're there, so you and I are sitting there, we've got the pizza, we're looking through the logs. I mean, a fairly obvious thing to, to say is, well, why, why put this barrier in the way of pagination? You know, like, why, why have people having to sort of scroll, press next, scroll, press next? You know, that doesn't seem like a great idea. Let's allow people to consume images um, without pagination. Um, and you know, and, and images are inherently much easier to you know to, 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 to consume, I think, than, than text. Um, and so we, so we so we invented infinite scroll. We also got rid of the text on the page. So we made the we made the pages sort of image only because we were because we did some sort of eye tracking studies and some other things to sort of discover that people had trouble switching between sort of an image processing mode and a text processing mode. You know, it was a pretty high cognitive load. Um, so we got rid of the text as well, and da-da, you know, there was, there was sort of infinite scroll on the web. It took us probably a year to get the scroll bar right. Um, like, it's, it's really, really hard, actually, um, because, you know, you can imagine you, you, you scroll down and you get to the bottom, the, the scroll bar's got to jump to somewhere as the next set of images load, and that isn't actually intuitive what to do. <laughs> um, it's also very, very difficult um, to build an interface that's sort of easy to navigate so that people can kind of scroll back up to the place that they, that they wanted to go to click on the image. And so sort of really thinking through how the scroll bar works um, turned out to be incredibly complicated. So you know, it took us probably more than a year to get that, that sort of interaction paradigm right. And again, lots of, I mean, you, you, you heard the talk uh, previously, you know, lots of experimentation, you know, let's try this with the customers, let's see how they react, let's see when they abandon, you know, how they click, you know, when people have trouble with navigation, all those kinds of things. So sort of a year of sort of relentless experimentation with customers to get the scroll bar right. But the actual idea was just a, you know, it's just a light bulb kind of obvious moment, again, based on just having data. Um, you know, and I, I think that, that patterns happened many times through my career. Yeah, I think that combination of UX and big data is an interesting one, which we've also seen come up before. Let's jump ahead a little bit. You know, you were at Microsoft, and then next? eBay. Another you know, a uh, company no one's heard of. What, what, <laughs> what, what why'd you go there and what did you do? Oh, it's a people story again. So, um, so I worked for this wonderful, this wonderful guy, Christopher Payne at Microsoft, who was the, the, the vice president, I think, who went to Bill Gates and said, we should build a search engine. So, you know, wonderful, wonderful leader of, of people. And um, he, he left Microsoft, I think, in around 2007, did his own startup, um, and his startup got acquired by eBay. So, so he's at eBay, he's in California, he kind of calls me up one day, you know, we should get a coffee. I said, sure. And then uh, two weeks later, I worked for eBay. Um, so another another kind of people story. 
And what did you do there? Um, so I, I, I came surprise, surprise to work on search. Um, you know, so I, the first thing I did was really uh, help with the, the search effort there. Um, by the end of my time at, uh, at eBay, um, I was running most things that you, that you see on the site and know as eBay.com, sort of up to the point where customers make a purchase. So you know, once, you, once money starts changing hands, they didn't trust me with that. So um, I kind of did everything up to that. You can compare and contrast. What, what did data look like at eBay versus early in your career? You said, you know, it was, it was you know, a, a few CDs at one point, and then? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the eBay of 2009 when I joined was um, primarily an enterprise data warehouse oriented uh, business. Um, so, you know, that they're one of Teradata's larger customers. Um, and, you know, that was sort of the, the primary vehicle through which data was used in the company. You know, by the time I left, um, you know, Teradata still played a pr very, very important role, but um, the company probably had a, 100 petabyte Hadoop cluster. Um, so, you know, it went through the revolution that I think, you know, many of you are aware of, of, of transitioning from being sort of a management-led company with sort of ideas and directives um, to being a company that was very much a data-driven company where you had sort of, you know, thematic work um, ideas and then you would use sort of data science and data to, to experiment to, to drive the business forward and, and deliver for customers. How does, how does that happen? That is very, very complicated. I'm gonna write a book about that at some point. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, in my mind, I'm a very simple guy, actually, as you can probably tell by the conversation, but, um, um, you know, in my mind, in my mind, everything that's ultimately successful sort of begins with a steel thread. You know, it begins with doing something simple and building up credibility, and then, and then that, you know, the steel thread snowballs or something. I don't know. I'm mix, mixing some metaphors. But, but um, you know, you, 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 you find something simple to do to create some value, and then folks come to you and say, can you do more of that? And so I think, I think the eBay story is, in essence, that. So in, in 2009, um, a wonderful set of guys that I was working with um, got very, very interested in uh, how you could deliver value for the business by making the site faster. So one thing I knew from Microsoft was that you know, speed equals money, right? So the, the faster the response time of a website, the more money you will make. It's very, very simple. Um, and that sort of wasn't yet deeply ingrained in the culture of eBay. You know, the site had become quite slow. Um, to, to render the search results page was about 270 HTTP GET requests. You know, and I think at the, I think at the time, you know, Google product search was probably doing 20. Um, so, you know, really big payload to render the page. And so we just, we just started in 2009 by saying, well, let's just run some A-B tests. And the A-B test infrastructure was fairly sort of fledgling and new, but let's, let's run some of you know, heavyweight versus lightweight and measure the financial outcome. And, you know, and then at that point, we're sort of narrowly focused on the financial outcome. I think later we became you know, richer in the metrics we embraced and the decision making. But, but people went, holy cow, <laughs> you did that? <laughs> We'd sell that much more stuff, you know, if you, if, if you know, if you if you did that, and so the AB testing infrastructure sort of became became known as something valuable. You know, working on search and sort of using data to experiment in search became something valuable, and you know, suddenly everybody's ears pricked up and said, "Can you can you do more of that? What what do you need? You know, what do you need to be able to really accelerate those kinds of roadmaps?" And so this thing kind of you know from being sort of a steel thread, it sort of exploded within the company. Um, across across everything that was going on in the company, you know, folks, everybody wanted access to the Hadoop cluster. Everybody wanted more data in the Hadoop cluster. You know, everybody wanted to hang around with the with the search science team and sort of figure out what what, what was it that they did um, that, that drove value. And, and suddenly, this thing kind of sprouted and, and grew. And and you know, I'd, I'd say that's now the dominant culture within the company is a very sort of data driven, bottoms up uh, way of doing things. Jeff Hammerbacher had, had, had once said, you know, the hardest thing for a data science or you know, search science team is to, to prioritize because everybody wants your time. How did you figure out what, who, whom got your who got your time? Oh, I still have a lot of trouble with that. Um, I think that um, you know, in in my mind, um, you know, I. I have a fairly simple way of working, and every time I, every morning I come in, I write down the five things that I want to achieve today, um, and then I don't go home till I achieve them, and that causes me to prioritise <laughs> because because um, you know if I'm if I, if it's if it's 5:30 p.m. and I've been there since 7 a.m. and I've and I've only crossed off one thing, I know it's going to be a really long day. Um, mm -hmm. So so in my mind, I you know I, I take I take some time every morning to really carefully think about how I can add the most value. I write that down, and then I make sure that's where I where I spend my energy, and that helps me sort of you know when I'm looking at something I can do on my calendar, decide if that's something that's important. And of course things come sideways at you 
where you, you have to say, hey, yeah, I've got to do that right now, and I'm going to have to delay the thing I wanted to do. But, I'm, but I, I'm very conscious about how I use my time. And so now you're at Pivotal. What's going on there? Yeah, Pivotal's cool. Um, so I'm in, my, uh, I'm in my fifth month at Pivotal. It's the first. It's the first, as you can tell by the discussion, I mean, it's the first real enterprise software um, engagement I've had since actually 1991. Um, so it's been a really long time. Um, but the thing, that, the thing that really interested me about Pivotal, um, again, there's a people story behind it, but I'll talk about the technology story. But um, the thing that really interested me about Pivotal is this idea of uh, taking these kinds of revolutions that happen within places like eBay and making those revolutions possible for all businesses on the planet. Um, and you know, I, I got to sort of thinking about what that revolution looks like. And you know, I, I think at some level, everybody wants to build applications. And I think you, know, you can think of software applications as being an example of that. But, but you know, if you're FedEx or somebody, you know, one of your applications is you have, you have drivers who drive around in trucks and deliver packages. I mean, that's a kind of application that you build. Um, Everybody has applications. These applications produce vast data sets. These da data sets require analytics, and from that analytics, you build better applications. So there's this kind of there's this kind of flywheel that can go around this triangle, really, of, of you know, application, data, analytics. And I and I think that at the core of, of these large successful internet businesses is that is that flywheel spinning very fast. And I and I and I. Uh, Pivotal's mission very much re resonated with me when I got talking to the guys who run the company. They're saying, "Look, you know, we 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 see how we see how this revolution is happening, and we want to be part of helping people build applications, helping people store every piece of data that they create, and then helping people powerfully uh, understand that data so that they can create better applications." And so I really liked I really liked that problem statement, that that that, that vision. Um, so I so I signed up to do that. Terrific. All right, we've got about a minute, so it's time for the lightning round. I'm going to ask you a series of quick questions, and you are obligated to give me a set of very quick answers. OK. As opposed to really long answers, like I've been doing? Yeah. <laughs> Those were the ones I asked for. Ah. All right, here we go. Number one, what would you study if you were in school today? Um, medicine. Uh, what's the most interesting thing you've read recently? Um, Actually, honestly, it's, a, it's the stories of the sad struggles of a uh, Class A baseball team in Ohio. If you had one piece of advice for uh, people who are earlier in their career, what would it be? Uh, it's all about people. Network, network, network. Who's your favorite person to follow on Twitter or other social media? Myself. Yeah, but, but excluding present company. Yeah. Um, Oh, there's so many wonderful people. I'm so I'm so addicted to Twitter. Um, um, pass. Where do you get your best information? Um, from hallway conversation. If you had to work one other place other than Pivotal, where would it be? Right now, I don't aspire to work anywhere else, to be honest That's with you. That's a very good answer. Very I'll, I'll, final question. What would you invest in other than Pivotal? I would invest in uh, medical research. Please thank you. Mm.